Japanese bamboo baskets, of course, it's a, uh, it's a functional and also maybe decorative piece. It's part of that life cycle, and it's, it's living, living, it's not dead. It's still constant uh, moving, changing, and want to go back to nature. Some of the baskets are very uh, sort of organic, and some of them are perfectly round. You know, for the baskets. And I asked him, you know, how do you uh, make this so perfect uh, circle? And he replies, your heart has to be circle within. And I think that's what Ikebana people, you know, create their arrangements. Your heart needs to be a circle. As this day, Indonesia is still very patriarchy and it's it's a combination between Islamic patriarchy law and then the state patriarchy. But women through weaving kind of get recognition and also have kind of find a way to a challenge the system by making it, master the technique, the production itself. This is from my mom. My mom got from my grandma, but my mom gave it to me actually when she was not feel well. She passed away very young. This is very um, important for me. So. For me, it's very precious because it's about memory and about who is making it and it's given to me. and. I'm very, um, you know, like careful and happy to, to have it. And for me, it's beyond the body as an art, but it's a message and also always remind me about what we have in the family, being together or being separate. This divination tray is called Okon. It is used by Babalawo, who are the, these are the diviners, to whom you go if you want to find out something about the future, something about your job, something about your family, or, see, or even about war. So everybody sort of, you know, everybody goes to the Babalawo to find out something they do not know. It's the circle of the world controlled by the gods at the cardinal points. And in that circle, well, like from a television set, we will be able to read our future because when he throws the opuela on the ground, he then marks the particular permutation in white chalk on the tray, and there it is. The rhythms that back the gods, that back the festivals, included beats like dum dum pa, dum dum du pa, dum dum pa, dum dum du pa, which is a beat of rap. A man was showed it proved his manhood not so much by muscle but by mental agility and the ability to master kinzonji. Kinzonji means the art of parlance, the art of speech. That whole tradition of of rapping in combat situations, that's clearly one of the roots of rap. For me the beadwork is a form of spiritual prayer. Just the act of threading beads is like a meditation and it brings you really deep into your yourself through the process of it your hopes and your desires kind of take a physical form when I finish a piece it's really not completed until after it leaves my hands um, it doesn't come to its true fruition I think until it's used in some sort of ceremonial context when it's wearing this crown is transformed. He's no longer known by his first name. He can no longer be called Bob or Joe or anything. He's revered like any other divinity. These images are representations of the spirit. And whether they're captured on wood or on tin, they are representations of spirit and faith. And people use these images, I use these images, as a way of connecting to that divine source.
an object has to serve many levels and many duties and be able to keep its essential quality. So it's not only what it represents, it's what is placed. Every altar must have what I call a noble tension. It cannot be so lame as to be uninspiring, but it cannot be so aggressive as to inspire fear. It has to be powerful to inspire trust, but gentle to inspire confidence. That's the noble tension. It is such an expression of faith. It's also a summoning of the spirit. And what happens when you summon the spirit? You're saying, I believe you exist. And not only do you exist, you care about me and you're going to help me with my problems. And the more that that faith manifests itself, the more true it becomes, the more the faith increases. And so the practice, you know, itself is regenerative. And pretty soon, people's altars are miraculous. This is a rock. This is a stone. You know, this Shiva Lingam, it's a, it's a stone. The forces of nature acted on this, whether it's the hand of the, of the Santero who made the, the Elegua, or whether it's the forces of the river and the, and the ocean, in the case of the Shiva Lingam, that shaped uh, and tumble these stones to come out with this divine shape that they say is the shape of the soul. But at the end of the day, they're objects. What do I do to meet these objects? What do I have to summon up through myself to, to begin to understand how they live in me? Practically every object that you see on view in these galleries had a specific purpose to fulfill. These objects all intervened in people's lives in some very particular manner. They are objects of artistic genius, but they weren't made only for visual delight. Their visual form and their beauty and their power and their impact are all essential to the ways that they act the ways that they intervene, but it's the combination of their outward form and beauty and their inner power and efficacy that makes them work. Every year around December 21st, we do a ceremony to recharge the earth with the rays of the sun. It's a practice that has been going on for thousands of years and still continues today. We don't take those old objects out of the museums, but what people will do is they carve new sunstones. Because those old sunstones sometimes may have belonged to a particular medicine man or a shaman, and we have to respect that shaman, that medicine man, that family that own that, and new communities will continue that tradition. So it's not, it's not a matter of seeing things in the museum that are objects fixed in the past, they're so old that they have no meaning to the present, they have a lot of meaning to the present. Most of our students have never been to a museum before. When we encourage them to use and incorporate identity, they are more than ready to, to instill their art with this idea themselves, their nationality, their heritage and their culture. And it's only wonderfully underlined when we actually can go and experience objects that are very closely connected to the artist and cultural identity. When you see an object, refocus your lens. Think about the people who made this object and how they used it. And let your imagination also take you on a journey of other peoples, of other lands. It's the best education you can have.